This is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for the 2022 Kentucky Derby by talking to Megan Devine, getting her read on this year's horses. We're talking to her actually live from Churchill Downs. So pretty fun addition for this year once again to get her read on her favorite bets for this year's Derby. My name is Jim Sadas. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, we were off last week, kind of. We had a, an episode yep. of Ariel Epstein, but like I was not here because I was in France and Spain chilling. How was your quote-unquote off week from the show? Quote unquote, I don't even remember what I did. Let's talk about what you did. How was your vaca- how was your honeymoon? Awesome. Um, so like we we did Paris and then Marseille and then Barcelona. And we were in Paris, we were talking about like our, our itinerary, and we were like, oh, we're going to Marseille next. And like everyone there was like, uh, why are you going there? Um <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, we have friends there. So like we were visiting friends, and mm-hmm. I think Marseille wound up being my favorite part of the trip, honestly, because like we did like a hiking experience. And they have these things called Kalonks. And it's kind of like, um, it's a big mountain where you have like beaches in between the mountains and stuff like that. So like we hiked it and it was really fun. It's like a gradual incline. So it's not like you're like hiking a mountain. It's kind of just like you're walking in an incline for a very, very long time. But it was really cool. Got some awesome views. Uh, we had like baguette lunch uh, once we got there. Cool. So I had blue cheese that like, tastes like it punched you in the face um yeah. so well, that's, like, that's not a good stuff supposed to be yeah it was it was awesome i had a, i had a great time and i'm awesome. i'm like happy to be back because i missed sports uh when i missed like work weirdly and missed my dog but like it was a it was a great time yeah that's awesome i mean there's plenty of soccer going on over there right now so yeah we were actually in barcelona the day uh with sunday they were, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't honestly remember what they were doing. Cause I don't pay attention to soccer, but like they had a big game that day and we were there. Yep. And it was a fun atmosphere, like being around people. We were in Paris uh, during the French election. So like Ooh. weird Just... timing to be in different places. Uh, right. Luckily, like it was not a, a bad situation for the French election. Cause like, it seemed like it could have been pretty bad in terms of like people's reaction to it. Uh, right. But one of being okay. Have you been to either Paris or Barcelona? I've definitely been to Paris. I love it. I would like to go back for an extended amount of time. So yeah. perhaps one of these days. So we got to get you to Barcelona too then because yeah. um, great Just city. A game at the Camp Nou. And, yep, yep. And then, was... uh, you know, in Madrid, there was a huge game yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, Champions League semifinal. Man City was up two goals on aggregate after the 90th minute. And somehow Real Madrid scored twice in stoppage. It was unbelievable. And then they, and then they won. In, yeah, in, in extra time, it was it was one of the more unbelievable sporting things I've ever seen. I don't know what the odds were when it hit the 90th minute and they were right. down two goals against the best team in the world. Right, but I can't think that they were they were very good. Yeah, so um, it was and and yeah. I, I, I believe that the Bernabeu has, I mean, it's one of these places that's in excess or near a hundred thousand people, and that must have been fun to go from you know down to like right like one of the most electric wins i've ever seen yeah i mean like it would have been awesome to go to a game even though again like i'm not a soccer person like just to be around that atmosphere for like a european soccer match right. like that would an important one i should say too like right. that would have been really fun we didn't have time to do it because like we were just kind of buzzing around uh from place to place but it would have been really fun to do still would love to go back and do that you know maybe a trip to to barcelona but mm-hmm. we got a lot of other places on our bucket list we got to get you first so uh but so like, great time um very sunburned at one point luckily no longer there um but it was a, a blast for sure happy to be back though just in time to talk kentucky derby so we're gonna talk with megan divine you can find her on uh twitter she is at megan divine tv she is also one of the hosts in the horse racing happy hour podcast she is on america's best racing and also owns her own uh company called vid horse which does a lot of horse racing videos so well versed in the world of horse racing we're talking to megan about this year's kentucky derby get her read on this year's field, who she likes, and she has a different opinion of the favorite than uh, what you may get at the sports books, and get a read on this year's race 
in just one second. But first, a quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. You name it, you can find us there. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Before we talk to Megan, though, got to go back to the NFL draft, which was this past week, and recap what went down there. Covering the past. So the one downside of being in my honeymoon last week is I didn't get to watch the NFL draft. Um, I would wake up in the morning and check my phone. And I remember the first round, I was like looking at the the picks and like, okay, this, this, you know, this is interesting. And didn't realize that the trades had happened until like at least 10 minutes later. I was like, oh man, Traylon Burks and AJ Brown playing side by side. That's kind of fun. And then I was like, oh, just kidding. That's not happening. Uh, but it seemed like kind of a fun round. And also, it seemed like a lot of people profited from a betting perspective. And Ed, you talked about Kenny Pickett going top 10 here on the show, but it sounds like <laughs> the, the stuff you sent out in your email performed pretty well. Yeah, so, I, you know, the week... Uh, yeah, when I talked about it on covering the spread, I had Kenny Pickett in the top 10. and But I also had, um, you know, I also had some positions on Kenny Pickett being the first quarter quarterback and i couldn't remember which one i talked about on the show and which one i put in my newsletter so kenny pickett going in the top 10 was dead the week of the draft (laughs) he and both both he and malik willis were dropping rapidly so i actually bet pickett over 12 and a half i believe to kind of hedge my bets a little bit um and then that closed at 16 and a half in some places to just to give you some sense of just how his stock was dropping when I came on the show, like his stock was actually rising according to the data on grinding the mocks. And then it just took a complete nosedive. So for Pickett to go 20 um, and, and Malik Willis strangely not being taken until the third day of the draft, I feel got feel like I got a little lucky there. So feel pretty fortunate uh, with that one. You know, some of the other bets that I wrote about in the newsletter uh, wrote about Dr. Eager's tip. Dr. Eric Eager, uh, he he really liked over, gosh, was it 10 and a half SC, SEC players? I forget the exact number, but it went well over. Um, so that was a nice one. Uh, a couple of Georgia uh, defensive guys ended up getting in the first round, some of the guys that weren't expected to go in the first round. And then, yeah, the day of the draft, um, you know, I made predictions for the top five players based on both the sharp mocks that I collected and then, and then some of – the uh bait and market data as well so but at that point Trayvon Walker was going number one uh he was like minus 500 so that was relatively easy there was some question about who would go number two Aiden Hutchinson was a favorite but there was a lot of mar- money coming in on, tri- on Kayvon Tribodeau uh those markets were like a roller coaster the day of the draft finally you know Hutchinson ended up I think closing around minus 200 ish and he ended up going number two and then early that week, uh, Derek Stingley uh, became the betting favorite at number three, uh, going to Houston. That happened, and then there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of chatter on Sauce Gardner going number four, both with the sharp mocks and the markets. So I had those top four in my newsletter, so that was kind of nice. Yeah. And then and and then based on that, like I knew that if Thibodeau didn't go number two, he probably wasn't going to hit the under on four and a half. So uh, I had him over four and a half in the newsletter. So that hit as well. He did go number five, which was actually a huge surprise to me. Uh, Charles Cross, the offensive tackle was like a pretty big favorite to go to the giants there, but they completely switched course, went with the, I don't know. I would, I would say high variance, uh, deep, you know, edge rusher from Oregon there. Um, So, you know, overall for the draft, I I was up a couple units, nothing to write home about um but you know it's good to be it's good to be ahead and yeah. uh and looking forward to next year well that sec one you mentioned ben brown of pro football focus is on our show he talked about that one too uh liking the sec yeah, over okay. and he also had stingley to go top 10 which was plus money at one point and yeah. wound up going third overall so yeah, he, he, he went up his stock yeah. went way up last week the last yeah. week before the draft and like I think, again, I think that there were a lot of smart people tuned in who did well at the NFL draft. And I saw a quote from Chris Andrews somewhere on Twitter talking about how, like, just how miserable it makes him to have to, like, yep. like provide markets for this stuff. And, like, we kind of sh- saw why that happened again. And, like, 
it's something to just know. Like I, I'm in New York. I can't bet it. So I didn't pay as much attention this year as I, I typically would in terms of like the betting stuff. But like, if you're in a state where you can bet the draft, you absolutely should take advantage of that. Cause it seems yep. like it's a spot where there is a good amount of edge to be had. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the real trick for me, I think is like trying to figure out whether the markets move first or whether, you know, you can get information from sharp mocks and, and other insiders. Um, I, I put together sharp mocks maybe about a week before the draft. And I think seven out of 10 of them already had Walker at number one. And this is when he was an, an underdog. And um, yeah, luckily I got a really good price on that over the weekend before all the market shifted. So, and then, you know, like, I feel like, you know, for example, when Stingley became the prohibitive favorite at number three, that wasn't the time to go against that and say, oh no, let's trust these sharp mocks there <laughs> that are from last week. That didn't feel like the right move as well. So if you do see a strong move in those markets, that's probably somebody with some sharp information, although clearly it's never perfect because right. the person that had sharp information on Charles Cross to go to the Giants at number five, that didn't work out. So, but, but I think in general, you know, that's the kind of thinking that, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing you got to do. You got to figure out information versus markets and, and which one you can trust. And that comes with experience, you know, doing this stuff. So, you know, I don't know if like taking notes on what you notice this year is like the key thing to do, but because it's such, it's a once in a year event. So right. take note of what happened this year and go back over those notes next year. I, I do that with NFL DFS every year. You know, I take notes at the end of the year, go back to those notes at the beginning of the next year so I can kind of refresh myself. Of, okay, what did I learn last year? And how much does that matter for this year? And I, I'd recommend that for sure, especially with a, a thing as unique as the NFL draft. So we'll come back to that next year once again, hopefully uh, get some more money then. But for now, it's time to talk about the 2022 Kentucky Derby. We're going to do so with Megan Devine. You can find her on Twitter at Megan Devine TV. And of course, you can find her on the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast and America's Best Racing. We're going to get her thoughts on the 2022 Kentucky Derby live from Churchill Downs to preview Saturday's race. Covering the present. Let's bring Megan Devine back into covering the spread live from Churchill Downs. Once again, we've done this with Megan for the past couple of years now. Megan, we appreciate the time in a chaotic, crazy week for you. How are you doing today? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, a chaotic and crazy seem like casual words for my <laughs> schedule. I, like, I'm not even quite sure if I could come up with something else to describe it. But uh, yeah, basically, in, in a nutshell, I wake up at like three o'clock in the morning, I don't get home until very late at night, and then I wake up and do it all over again. So it's uh, Derby week is a little bit crazy. Yeah, so for us, we know what happens Saturday. We know right. everything that goes on then. But what are you doing during the week to <laughs> not just to prepare for like, but just like doing your job? You know, what, what yeah. goes on for you during the week? For sure. So this is actually my 10th year with NBC Sports. So I work for them as an uh, ENG producer. So when you're watching the broadcast, anything that you see that's like on the backside in the stables with the trainers, the horses in their stalls, um, horses on the track working out, I produce all of that stuff for them. So the horses wake up early too, and they uh, come out to train between the hours of 5.15 and 10 o'clock in the morning. Most of them on the early part of that. So we have to be here with the cameras and make sure everything's in place to capture all the action for everybody watching for from home on, on Derby day. That's a lot. Yeah. Like that's, that's, that's a lot, that's a lot to yeah. be doing throughout the entire week. And it's not just one day. <laughs> yeah. You've been doing this since Tuesday, I believe you said, or was it since Monday? Monday, actually Monday. Yeah. I mean, the good thing about it is that it, it, and I know we've talked about this before and we'll go into detail again, but you know, the good thing about it is that I get kind of an up close and personal view of some of these horses, mm -hmm. which I think really, really helps me or really hurts me by like giving me too much of like a hunch play, I guess, you know, sometimes if I, if I see something. Um, but because I'm able to see these horses, I can really incorporate that into my handicapping. So when I'm studying for my shows to be on air uh, on Friday and Saturday, it's I've got all this extra knowledge that doesn't come from the form. Well, I think that's a good thing, though, is because you are incorporating different knowledge than what the bookmakers are looking at. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, certainly they're probably getting some kind of knowledge, but like sure. if you can find a nuanced edge in terms of where you're, how you're hand, analyzing things, you mm -hmm. can actually like that can be a benefit for two, for sure, too. So let's actually start yeah. there. Let's talk about what you've okay. learned at the track this week, because you've said that because you have a deep knowledge of horses, you can kind of look at them and kind of study them. You get a lot of value from the in-person stuff. So what have you learned you think this week in your time at Churchill Downs? <laughs> so much. Um, I mean, it's, it's one thing to kind of, obviously I watch a lot of replays when I'm handicapping these races and uh, you know, we'll read the form and all that, but I think seeing them 
in the morning and especially here on, on Derby week, because it's, I mean, keep in mind we're, we're racing. So I'm dressed up uh, from Tuesday on to Saturday. So there's action here at the track. People are actually coming in the mornings. Like the general public is here to watch the Derby horses train during their um, specified time. So you have a lot more kind of buzz than you usually do. And, and these horses are young. They're only three years old. So really they're like teenage boys, uh, at FS, you know, like preteen. So, um, they can, they're still developing physically, mentally. And so they kind of have to take in everything that's happening around them because it's just a little bit of practice for the 150,000 people that'll be screaming on Derby day when the gates open. So, you know, if they can kind of get a handle on that and figure out how to compose themselves, they, they are certainly, well, um, much better off. And so I think the mental aspect, watching some of the horses and how they react to things, being in new places, if they're not typically here in Kentucky, if they ship in from California or other places um, is really helpful. But even just the physical of the horses getting over the track. Each surface is so different at every racetrack. And so some horses take to some surfaces better than others. And so watching their, you know, stride efficiency, if they're moving well, um, you know, what their attitude is like and how they handle the turns or, or working here and all that stuff is really important when you're kind of handicapping the race. So, um, so yeah, all those things go into it. I mean, specifically the horses that stood out to me over this track for a long shot, uh, the horse like Charge It, who is 20 to 1. Um, I thought he just floated over this surface. And I, I, he's a really, really efficient mover. So he's not a horse that I expected to come in here and like. But he's one that's caught my eye. And even the Japanese horse, Crown Pride, too. He has been, ah, oh my gosh, just working amazing over this track. And working often, too. Typically, we work horses every, like, seven days is when they get a timed workout. He's worked every seven days, then three days, then seven days, then three days. He just worked yesterday three days before the kentucky derby which you really don't see so that horse is going to be super fit is that a good thing like do you view that as being a positive like an endorsement of like it's endurance yeah. or how do you view that i mean it's different because obviously in different places you have different i don't know exercises different types of training techniques and stuff like that and so um it's very unusual here in the u.s at least in modern times i think years ago trainers used to give a horse a blowout you would call it so like a a breeze um really close to the race some people even said like day of uh in some cases way back when but the animal has changed so much just through breeding that they're a little bit more lighter boned and we don't typically see that um nowadays but I, I guess this is somewhat normal in Japan. So it's just a really different way of approaching things. Different ways to catch a fish. <laughs> Megan, how old did you say these horses are? Really? They're three years old. So all these horses so, are, are three years old. Did the you horses typically like, live until they're like 20-ish, 30. But you described it as preteen? Mm -hmm. yeah they're they're babies i mean they're they we start horses uh you start you can sell them typically a lot of these horses are sold as yearlings so when there's one years old and then they grow up a little bit more and then they can typically start their career as two-year-olds so i mean a horse might race until it's seven or eight years old if it's a gelding a little bit older typically it's like between four to six possibly um four and five so you know this is the very beginning of their career for many of them i mean there's a horse like Taba in the um Kentucky Derby, who this will only be his third start, you know, so he's got a lot of inexperience on his side because he's a young horse, hasn't had a lot of races. And so that's something else that goes into it too. Is this like putting my 10 year old out to race? Or <laughs> no, like, pretty what, much a hundred percent. Yeah. Like, a t like literally, legitimately <laughs> a 10 year old? line them up. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sometimes because also these horses you all have different breeding. And so some might develop faster than others. You know, you might have a horse wow. who maybe right now isn't able to do it, but then in a couple of months or a year, that's the horse that's better than the rest of them. You know, so they all kind of peak at different times and, and it's just trying to figure out, and that's a trainer's job is trying to get your horse to peak physically and, and mentally um, in time for the biggest race in our country. Yeah. That's fascinating. I was just reading a little uh -huh. bit about how they are. Um, there's, there's certain organizations that are uh, giving bonuses to 10 year old tennis players because they feel like they're <laughs> now the optimal balance of, um, you know, return on investment, but not, okay. not stressing them out when they're too young. Yeah. So it's that, I mean, that's, that's totally what it is here. I mean, the two-year-olds and the three-year-olds, that's a faster return on your investment because it takes a while to, to get to this point. You've got an 11 month pregnancy for mares before that you got to, you know, choose which stallion you're going to, then you got to raise the horse. And so by the time you're here at the Kentucky Derby, I mean, there's so much that has gone into bringing these horses to this point. 
And part of bringing them to this point is prep races. And mm -hmm. we've had a lot of those throughout the past yeah. couple of months. And that gives us at least an idea of what these horses can do on the track. So when you look at those prep races in this year, what did you learn from those and try to prep for Saturday? Yeah, I mean, they're super important. You know, it gives you the chance to kind of see horses up against each other. So you get matchups that you might see in the Derby, right? If there's horses coming out of the same prep races, you can see um, maybe if there was something that happened, did one horse, was it supposed to do really well? And then it flopped for whatever reason. Is there a reason for that? Did it run into traffic or something like that? Um, did it stumble out of the gate? Could be another thing. So those are really helpful. I typically try to kind of rate them on my own. We do that a lot of my podcast, the horse racing happy hour, and we kind of have our, our own graded stakes scale because with graded stakes, you've got grade one is the top level, like the Kentucky Derby and a few others. Um, grade two is right below that, then a grade three, as far as the toughness and prestige of the race. And so um, sometimes you get races that are, you know, grade one, grade two. And I think, eh, I, I kind of thought it was more of like a grade two or grade three caliber. Um, so I think if you could try to, qualify these races a little bit uh, and the types of horses that were in them oftentimes that really helps with seeing you know which horses might have been better prepared or which ones kind of had an easier route I mean it's no different than like a football schedule right I mean if you're if you're matched up against teams that are a little bit easier or something like that like that might be an easy win for you to go it'll help your record a little bit more but um but yeah it's you kind of have to really follow along throughout the the year in those prep races and and figure out how tough that was Excellent. So uh, we had the, the post draw on Monday. Uh, can you explain mm -hmm. to me what that means and what it has any significance <laughs> on uh, betting on Saturday? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, for these horses to get their number that's assigned to them, they actually have a, a randomized draw. So it's like little dice thing, they call it pills. Um, and so they, and the horses are, are drawn randomly as well in order. So they'll pull a horse name, they'll say, you know, Zandon or whatever. And then they'll shake up the little guy. <laughs> but not, it's not unlike playing craps a little bit, but you know, different. Um, and then they'll uh, they'll see what number comes up, and that's the post number for them. So it allows you know kind of more of a fair chance for for anybody. It's not like one person is getting preference of a better draw than others, which there can be. There's a couple of different um, things that goes into the starting gate. One would be. Um, from a pace scenario, sometimes that comes into play. If you're a horse that has a lot of early speed, you might want to be towards the inside because you don't have to, you know, it's just the straightest path, right? So, so it's not Pythagorean theorem or something, the triangle, I don't know, <laughs> that uh, you don't have to come all the way from the right side to go left to get to the rail and, and go forward. Um, so that's important. Also, they have to get all these horses in the gate and they don't do that at the exact same time. So they kind of go um, two by two. And so if you have a horse that's really, we say fractious in the gate, that's kind of a little uneasy, doesn't like being in confined quarters, uh, which some horses don't like, and you're one of the first to load, you've got to wait for the rest of the field to load. That might mentally have an effect on a horse. They might be kind of prancing about and they're not, you know, their feet planted on the ground to then push off of and have a really clean start. So um, those kind of things can affect it. And so when you go to the post position draw, you're certainly hoping that your post position is going to match up with your horse's running style, whether they be a closer, or front running type, et cetera. Um, and also that hopefully you've got a horse that handles the gate well, which most of them do. Um, but if you do happen to have one that has a little bit of trouble, like I think California Chrome wasn't always very good in the gate a few years ago, um, that can really make a big difference in the start of your race. So we're not only talking about I mean, the equivalent for humans is, is putting my 10 year old in a <laughs> cage for what, 10 minutes before <laughs> letting him run off on a track. It's only, it's only a couple of seconds. Um, but sometimes, you know, if there's a horse that acts up a little bit and it does take them longer, say it takes them like 30 seconds to load the horse or so. I mean, that's a long, a long time. Yeah, Ask your 10 year old to sit there seconds. quietly for 10 seconds and then say, go. Yeah. <laughs> that's basically what it is. I can't do that now when I'm 30. So like that's <laughs> yeah. no shot. No shot if I'm right. younger. Uh-huh. A hundred percent. I mean it's it's no different than like track and field, just if you just were waiting there for a while and but you're all pumped up oh, and everything. And you know, to then go is is not the, always the easiest thing to do. The worst part of running road races is sitting there at the start line, which usually right. ends up being at least 10 to 15 minutes, which I uh -huh. try to avoid. <laughs> you know, like I try to, you know, jump over a gate and so yeah, that that's the right. You want to keep the blood pumped up and everything. And it's the same with the horses. You'll see the jockeys after the post parade. They take the horses and they warm up, they jog, they, you know, kind of run slowly around a little bit just to get the blood flowing, make sure the horses is focused and ready to go. Um, so it's kind of the same thing. So then stand there and just wait 
they're kind of like, are we doing this? Are we not doing this? You know? <laughs> or, and you have people in the crowd too. So now you've got a horse in a confined space and there's 150,000 people, you know, cheering and stuff. And they're like, what is going on? <laughs> Cause they've never, these horses have never seen that many people at a track right. until this day. Yeah, it's yeah. uh it's an interesting dynamic for sure and something fun to consider. And you talked about that two years ago in the twenty twenty one, which is in August, about the the importance of that too. September, so, yeah. Yeah. So or yeah, so the September race back then. And luckily no big changes for this one, but definitely it does matter at times for sure. So let's talk for about sure. the favorites here for this year. Zandon is a favorite at TVG. They are three to one. We've got Epicenter at seven to two. Nobody else mm-hmm. in that same tier. They're the runaway favorites right now. So when you look at those two, what makes them the favorites in your eyes? That's a good question on Zandon because he is not the favorite in my eyes. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Who is the favorite? Yeah, I mean, eyes? Epicenter, for okay. sure. I mean, for Zandon, for me, he did have a very impressive bluegrass race, which was a grade one. Um, but I think there were probably some good grade two prep races that were just as good as that. So that's kind of an example of, you know, while technically on paper, that was a better race than some of the other prep races. I don't necessarily think with the field that was in there, that that was harder than some of the others. Um, So for me, I've kind of moved it down in my own ranking. Um, So if you take that one win out, that one race uh, out, then his only other win in his four race career is a sprint race that he had at Belmont. And so you're talking about distance is huge. You know, you, you don't send the same guys that are running the, you know, 55 meter to, go run a marathon. <laughs> that's not the same body type. Right. And so when you have a horse, that's really good at, at one thing. And this horse was at sprinting. And a lot of times trainers, you start off their young horses sprinting and that's fine. And then they kind of move them up. Um, I don't know that there's enough, you know, I, I, I think he's a really good horse, but I think there's others in here that have proven themselves at a longer distance, a bit more than this one has. Uh, he's had good, okay performances, even where he didn't win. He had a, an okay a nice second only by a nose um and then an okay third but uh his third he lost to epicenter and i thought epicenter was probably the better horse of those two and then he dodged epicenter by going to the bluegrass where epicenter then you know continued to run in louisiana and won and so i i genuinely thought epicenter was going to be the favorite of this race i was shocked when he wasn't but from a betting standpoint i loved it because <laughs> everybody just go bed zandon <laughs> just leave me at epicenter alone <laughs> So you got epicenter at seven to two. Do mm-hmm. you still think there's value in that number where it currently stands? I mean, it depends on how you play it, right? Um, uh, yes, I, I do think there is because uh, you're still, even if you just did a win bet, you're you're still going to get paid out for it if you invest enough in it. I mean, if you're doing a two dollar win bet, no, you're not going to make very much money. But if you feel pretty confident about it at seven to two, if you increase your base wager, you know, so say you you play twenty bucks, fifty bucks, hundred bucks, whatever it is um, on there, I, I think you're still going to get paid pretty decently and plus the pools are big on kentucky derby day anyway so you know you've got uh i think there's some value i wouldn't be surprised to see unfortunately epicenter at a much lower price than seven to two but uh that's where i really wish we had fixed thoughts because i would have i would have put this in a long time ago <laughs> yeah awesome megan are there any other horses uh with some longer odds that uh, are piquing your interest yeah, I mentioned um, Charge It, who I thought was pretty impressive just physically on the racetrack throughout the week. He just really floated over the surface and um, just looked so comfortable. He looks like he's a horse that's kind of got it together. He's not one that's really um, acted up very much in any, anything that I've seen. So I didn't come into this kind of expecting to like him. But on paper, I mean, he has had three races in his career. Um, just one win for him as well, which was a, a maiden race, meaning his um, you have to we say break your maiden. So you have to win a maiden race typically, not have to, but most don't do, um, before you move to the tougher races. And so he only has one maiden win. And then he's got a second place finish in the Florida Derby where he ran against White Barrio. So all of his races have been at the distance of a mile or greater. So clearly this is a horse that they fought from the beginning. Not like they tried him at six furlongs, like I mentioned with Sandin, and then, you know, saw how he handled the stretch out. For this horse, they thought this is one that isn't going to be fast enough to win a sprint race, but he's probably got enough speed and enough stamina to win a longer distance race. So I tend to like horses like that in a race like the Kentucky Derby because you're going a mile and a quarter, which none of these horses have gone that distance before. So that's a really, stamina and endurance are huge when you're talking about this type of a race. So he's one for me that I thought was really interesting. And then um, Crown Pride, the Japanese horse, who, again, I I really didn't think that I was going to be a believer in this one, (laughs) especially with the kind of unique training style that they have. Um, 
how many times he's worked out. But for me, I think in watching these workouts, it's more about how they did it than the, the time, a lot of it. And so he actually worked on May 4th. So just yesterday, um, it was like forever ago. <laughs> um, and he worked four furlongs in 46 and change, which a t- a typically, you know, a, a pretty decent time for four furlongs is 48 seconds. He did it in 46 and that's really fast. But the way he did it, I would have expected to see the jockey maybe like really pushing on him and in the morning and trying to get him to, you know, go forward and asking him for speed, but he wasn't. The horse just did it really well within himself. And so, um, yeah, he, he looks fit. It's very different. You know, he's going to have to, this horse is in other countries. They run both directions. We only run to the left hand side. He's run right-handed and left-handed. I don't think he's ever seen a crowd quite as big as what he's going to see on Derby Day. Um, and even like the gate, the starting gate, when it opens, there's a bell that rings. In other countries, there's no bell. So the starting gate's just open. So earlier, I think it was last week, he actually dumped his rider. So the rider fell off because the horse spooked at the bell that <laughs> after it came out of the gate. But they've schooled him in the gate. Um, you know, So he's practiced a lot of times this week. So I think he, he should be okay with that now. But, um, but yeah, I mean, he's just, he really fit. He's like a gym rat. (laughs) (laughs) Insights on the ground from Megan Devine. So last year you got engaged at the Derby. This year it's your birthday. So I I feel like that has to, that has to add up to being just a great week. So like we're looking epicenter, we're looking charge it and crown pride. Uh I feel like we got to feel really good about them given the good vibes around you for this weekend. You know, I hope so. Yeah. The the Derby this year is really competitive. I think there's a lot of nice horses. Messier is another one that I'm not really sure what to do with yet, um, that I'm including at an eight to one price. So not, not as much of a price, but, um, or as the 20 to ones, but still, still some value. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a busy week. It's a crazy week. Honestly, I, I almost prefer my birthday to be the day after Derby, right. but that'll never happen because it's the first Saturday in May and you can only go up to seven to get right. that number. <laughs> um, so I don't, I probably will not even remember that it's not the <laughs> day on Derby day. We will be so busy. <laughs> well, regardless, we remember now, happy birthday, Megan. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time and your insights. And we appreciate yeah, it. Have fun. Anytime. Good luck to Thank you. We'll have you again, on again soon. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Megan Devine for swinging by and breaking down the 2022 Kentucky Derby. If you want to deploy the stuff that Megan mentioned, you can get, do so via TVG. The Derby is here and there's no better place and better time to get in on the action than TVG because new players can bet risk-free up to $200 on TVG. That is right. You can get up to $200 back in site credit on your first single horse win wager if your horse doesn't win. Plus, TVG's Money Back Special gives every customer up to $10 cash back on select races if your horse finishes second or third. Plus, you'll also get access to free picks, analysis, and so much more. Win or get your money back for the Derby with TVG. Sign up today at tvg.com slash cover to bet risk-free up to $200. Again, tvg.com slash cover, as in covering the spread. We got our own little promo code over here. tvg.com slash cover to bet risk-free up to $200 on this year's Kentucky Derby at TVG. One of the big things I want to talk about here coming out of the Megan interview is the value of in-person information. And like, it's not in the sense of like, oh, if I can watch Max Scherzer warm up, that'll be worth a lot. That's, it's not, it's more so like this specific event where you actually can gain information from being in person. And it's probably information that may be under accounted for when it comes to this, because most of the money coming in the Kentucky Derby is not going to be from people like Megan who are on the ground. And I think that Ed getting her specific Intel on that stuff right now is really fun. And I think it's a key thing that I value a lot hearing what she has learned from being at Churchill Downs. For sure. I kind of think of it, imagine like you're betting on 10 year olds playing basketball (laughs) and you had some inside information that 10 year old Joel indeed got in a fight with 10 year old James Harden you know, in the <laughs> locker room before the game, that, that would probably be useful information. Yeah, it, it certainly would. And like, it is so unique in terms of like the, the atmosphere around these horses and stuff like that. Um, and it's just really good information to have. So I really value Megan's insights. She did nail the winner a couple years ago, back in 2020, that race you mentioned uh, with the horse who would jolt to the right out of the gate. She's like, okay, the post position is good. Um, we should feel good about this horse. So 
Cool to talk to Megan, get her insights there. Again, follow her on Twitter at Megan Divine TV and check out all of her work on the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast and America's Best Racing as well. Let's dive into covering the future for this week. And Ed, obviously a weird week with things kind of up in the air, but it sounds like your baseball stuff is up and running now over the power rank. Absolutely. It was, uh, you know, it has not been the best couple weeks at work just because I've, uh, uh, I took an opportunity to pour all my code over from Python two to Python three. So I didn't update. I mean, you know, my, my Matt kept on yelling at me saying Python two will no longer be supported. Python two will, will no longer be supported. Please switch. And, uh, I finally did an update and, and my Python two was just gone. It, it, it was like, they, they literally during the update wiped out like my Python framework. So I was like, okay, Fun. you know, we're not, you know, if it were during the middle of the NFL season, I would have just, downloaded python 2 again and, and kept going on with my life but it was april so uh i took an opportunity but unfortunately that, that means it took me a little while longer to uh to port everything but it also makes me pre- Man, i think i have i don't know thousands of lines of baseball code yeah and stuff that was written a long time ago i was like oh i actually put a lot of work into this at one point um but uh yeah so i have everything it, it includes the most uh current data I'm way closer to the markets on a team like the Mets now than it was before. And uh, so you can check that out at thepowerrank.com slash predictions. All right. Thepowerrank.com slash predictions to get Ed's baseball numbers. I'm running my own numbers too for baseball this year. I'm typically tweeting those, but I'm also uh, putting them on the Action Network app. So if you have the Action Network app, you can follow me there. Uh, putting most, It's mostly money lines and then strikeout props because that's what I have models for. So uh, both of us chucking along with MLB stuff right now. For covering the future this week, though, I want to talk some Formula One because there are going to be a lot of eyes this week on Formula One with this being the first ever Miami Grand Prix. So... I figured I'd talk up uh, a bet my numbers like for that before practice and qualifying, which starts on Friday. That's for Valtteri Botas finished top six, which is currently plus 195 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. The implied odds there are 33.9%, whereas I have Botas at 39.9% to finish inside the top six. So six percentage points of uh, gap there between my numbers and the sportsbook. And with Botas, it is a small sample because... I mean, it's true for all races this year, given the, the car changes, but all old data is bad because this is his first year at Botas with Alfa Romeo. Big step down from what he was with previously with Mercedes. So it's we have to lean on small samples with Botas, but that small sample is pretty good so far. I lean on a number that I call speed score. It's a, a number I create my, myself. It includes a driver's finishing position, but leans heavily on practice times, qualifying speeds to get a better idea of how good they were, how fast they were, in downplaying the finish because finishes can be fluky, especially with attrition and stuff like that. Only six drivers this year have had a speed score better than 10.0 in all four races. And those guys are the two Ferrari drivers, the two Red Bull drivers, George Russell and Valtteri Botas. Botas's best speed score actually came two weeks ago, the most recent race in Imola. Uh, he almost ran down Russell for a fourth place finish there. Didn't get there, finished fifth. But uh, he was also sixth in the opener. So Botas has been top six in two out of four races so far. He was eighth in one of the other ones, retired in the other. So, you know, two for four so far. Uh, Again, the implied odds here, 33.9%. The Ferrari engines are very good this year. Botas seeming to benefit from that as Alfa Romeo does run a Ferrari engine. There will be pretty stiff competition for the top six this week. Um, I'm not expecting huge surges from Mercedes, but Russell's still been very good. Uh, my numbers like Fernando Alonso quite a bit. And of course, we've seen McLaren tick up uh, the past couple weeks too. So it's not like an easy spot to be in to get in the top six if you allocate four spots potentially to Ferrari and Red Bull. But I still think that we're, we're counting for that enough with Botas here at plus 195. So my numbers do like Botas, plus 195 to finish inside the top six. It's weird to be on Botas given the transition from Mercedes to Alfa Romeo, but 2022 is a very weird year. So let's embrace that chaos and dive on in. Now, Ed, we got two American races in Formula One this year. Uh, we got Miami and Austin. We have three next year with one out in Vegas. So we got you to dive in the NFL draft, gotten you to, to bite on some golf too. Any chance we can get you to bite on Formula One at some point? Maybe, maybe. I just need to watch that Netflix series, I think. And then That's true. You do. It's, it's awesome. 
I would, I would recommend it. That's why I started doing this modeling to begin with. Oh, was, yeah. nice. uh, you know, enjoying that show. Um, and it was a, a, a sport my wife and I both enjoyed as a result of that. So built that out. It's done well so far for me. And I think that, so you like the Bundesliga because you say it's yeah. like, it's art kind of, you know, that kind of thing. It is. Formula One's very similar because it's, it's so engineering heavy. So I think that like, there there should be a heavy overlap between Bundesliga fans and Formula One fans from that perspective. It also gives me like the trashy reality TV aspect. Like that's kind of in there too. Uh, mm-hmm. But for you, I would say the Bundesliga aspect is what should attract you towards Formula One. All right, I'll check it out. I mean, wait, what do you think the art is? Like in the engineering of the car? Yeah, yeah. and like it, it translates well because like watching these cars – whip around the corners and sticking to the track, like the downforce they generate, it's absurd. So mm-hmm. I, I think that you would appreciate that, um, you know, if you were to watch it for a long enough time. All right. Sounds good. Check it out. All right. So we're going to get added here on Formula One in the very near future, but give me Botas plus 195 to finish top six on Sunday. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Good to be back in the saddle once again for this week, both literally and figuratively. Again, thank you to Megan Devine for swinging by and breaking down her thoughts on the 2022 Kentucky Derby. Give her a follow on Twitter at Megan Devine TV and check out the Horse Racing Happy Hour podcast and America's Best Racing for all of her insights. Ed, you mentioned uh, the PowerRank.com slash predictions for your MLB stuff. What else is going on for you over at the PowerRank? Yeah, we're still working on the the newsletter every week, at least for, I mean, definitely through May. Uh, I'll probably take a little bit of a break in June, but uh, Edward E. Garst and I have been and definitely been working on Seven Nuggets. Uh, got another interesting one coming out this Saturday, so you can sign up for that at thepowerrank.com. And I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for this week. Good luck to you betting the 2022 Kentucky Derby. Have fun. Enjoy that. Enjoy F1. Enjoy NASCAR, MLB, or NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs, whatever it may be. Good luck to you. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. What's up, guys? This is Jordan Spieth. If you're watching this video... Please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.